So um, my name is Rachel Laforet. I'm the program director at the School of Policy Studies, and it's my pleasure to be the MC today to balance out some uh, female gender presence on this on this panel. Um, we tried. We tried. <laughs> Um, you have over here on the screenshot a, a list of all the blogs that our prolific institute has been publishing since September. So please take a look at uh, some of these uh, topics that we're going to be talking about today. What I'm going to do is allow the panelists two minutes to introduce themselves and say a couple words about their research. In the meantime, those of you that have uh, used Slido before will be pooling the, the room to get some of your questions as we move along. So just as a reminder, where's the page? If you go on your cell phone and type hashtag MPA18, the screen's not working, um, you can actually write up your questions. I don't know where Celia is. <laughs> Celia? OK, so I'll get this started. But uh, just type hashtag MPA18, and you can submit your questions on uh, go to slido.com. It'll be fairly easy. And we'll be taking your questions as we move along. So over to you. I'll start with David. Thanks, Rochelle. I'm David Walker. Um, I have two minutes to tell you everything that I know about health policy, so I won't even try. I have um, an interest in health services organization and health system performance. My neighbor to my right will tell you there's no such thing as a system in healthcare, but to the extent that may be one of the reasons it underperforms. Um, and of course, it's cost. You'll see uh, the fact that we as Canadians are now spending, projected to spend $242 billion. Uh, this year on health care. So I'm interested in that. I'm also interested in the impact of an aging population, um, uh, the needs of that population and the way in which our society orients itself toward addressing those needs both inside and outside the health care system which ought to be all joined up. I also have an interest in public health, disaster preparedness, uh, pandemics, um, and the organization of societies around the world in addressing public health uh, needs. Well, I'm Duncan Sinkler, and uh, I don't do anything. I'm retired now. And, uh, but I, I used to be as tall as David uh, when uh, we started off the, the uh, whole idea that actually health care should be changed somewhat, and I'm still nursing my scars. Hi, uh, John Muscleri. I'm the uh, scientific director uh, for the uh, Canadian Frailty uh, Network, which is um, funded by the networks of centers of excellence. And one of our big uh, um, foci going forward is uh, knowledge mobilization or and influencing uh, policy, and specifically as to how it pertains to to, to people that are. Um, that are frail and in, and which uh, most of which are are elderly and are the most vulnerable in our society. So there's about one million people that are frail in, in Canada over the age of 65. About 40 percent of the 242 billion that uh, David said is spent on health care, spent on people over the age of 65. And what's really pertinent to people that are frail, about 20 percent of that is spent in the last year. Of of life. So what we're interested in is, is models and po changing policy such that we can better address the unmet health needs of uh, uh, people that are, uh, that are frail. Sorry to be a little late. I'm a cookie eater. Yes, thank you for pointing out my nutrition habits. I'm a medical officer of health. I'm relatively new in that role. I've been the Associate Medical Officer of Health at Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington for the last year and the new uh, Medical Officer of Health CEO for this region. So I, you could think of me as a family physician for 200,000 people. It's my responsibility to keep a population healthy. And I try through my team at Portsmouth and our three other locations across the region to keep the population healthy. So we work on big ticket items 
such as tobacco control, opiate control, healthy eating, active living, healthy early childhood development, and try to go upstream uh, rather than concentrating just uh, downstream on the healthcare system response uh, to keep a population healthy. Is that okay? Perfect. I'm uh, Chris Simpson. I'm a cardiologist uh, here in Kingston and uh, the Vice Dean Clinical in the Faculty of Health Sciences. Uh, a couple of years ago, I served a term as president of the Canadian Medical Association, um, uh, which was the year when medical aid in dying uh, was the big issue, and we went from sort of conception to legislation. Uh, seniors care was, uh, was the, the issue that I uh, focused most of my time on in uh, alliance and with the help of uh, many of the people to my left and right. And uh, my latest gig and interest is in uh, health care policy, uh, sorry, uh, health care quality. Uh, so I chair Health Care Ontario's uh, Quality Standards Committee, uh, which is charged with developing uh, quality standards um, across many different areas um, with an aim to reduce unwarranted and unwanted clinical practice variation. Hello, my name is Scott Carson. I'm a professor in the Smith School of Business across the street and was David's predecessor uh, in the School of Policy Studies here. Um, my interest is in governance structures and the way in which institutions and systems connect with each other. Um, a number of years ago, uh, um, most of us at this table, Chris and John and uh, Duncan and David and I put together um, four annual conferences looking at the broad question of whether Canada itself could have a pan-Canadian healthcare strategy. And, and uh, in the context of, uh, of that, I became very interested in the the way in which the politics and public policy in healthcare can be separated from the actual running of the institutions of healthcare. So I was interested to see the National Health Service in England uh, in 2014 as they restructured try to separate the Ministry of Health from the actual mechanics of running the NHS. Of course, the Ministry of Health had to retain its uh, policy authority but it was an attempt to get at something that in Canada we've tried to do a number of times for the uh, healthcare buffs in here who know about the Kirby report in 2002 and the Romano report in 2002. Both of those major pan-Canadian reports tried to find a way of separating out some body that would have a leading role in the running of the system from the actual politics which often intervenes between the two. So in all of this I kind of invented a, a model called the bicameral model and just to quickly finish off, the, uh, as you may or may not know, in Kingston, two of the hospitals integrated as of uh, April 1st. This was Hotel Jew and uh, Kingston General Hospital. And the way in which that integration is governed is by the use of this bicameral structure that keeps the governance of the actual operating institution and the governance of policy sort of separated with an operating agreement in between. So, fascinating to see how well that works out. So thank you for that introduction. So for those of you that are new to Slido, you've probably noticed that we're now crowdsourcing questions. And so I'll be taking questions from the list over here. Feel free to vote up and or down and questions will move around a little bit. And we'll start with the first question, which is a follow up. Oh, it just moved, but I'm still taking it. Andre Picard mentioned at the Duncan Sinclair lecture that um, the Canadian public has a fear of healthcare reform. How do you think we might mitigate this fear? And I'll leave it up to you to just uh, raise your hand if you have something to add to that question. Chris, you were the head of the CMA. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll take the bait. So um, this is a, a, a point that Andre has made many times in many of uh, the pieces that he's written, that he's written, and I think all of us had, have said at one time or another. Um, I think uh, the CEO of the Ottawa Hospital, uh, Jack Kitts, said it best when he said, our biggest barrier to health reform is persuading Canadians that we have a problem. So there's this sense out there that long wait times and uh, you know, inadequate access in general and some other shortcomings of the system are just simply the price that we have to pay in order to have so-called universal health care. And uh, when we start to contemplate reform, um, the forces of change, of course, create uh, lots of uh, nervousness and uh, a lot of uh, polarization. 
and uh, people shy away from having a meaningful conversation because they believe the alternative is somehow something different uh, than, than the noble ideals on which our, our uh, universal healthcare was founded. So rather than talking about the principle of making sure that, uh, that people are treated on the basis of need and not the ability to pay, we've sort of locked down on this notion that any discussion of change means that we're abandoning that principle, which is of course not necessarily so. Um, so we have a great difficulty uh, at the political level um, discussing this, whereas at the policy level, um, usually you get rooms of people like this and everybody's in agreement with how we might start to tackle the problem, but politically is where it always seems to stop. Duncan, you want to weigh in? <clears throat> Chris, there's a paradox in that people uh, such as these, those in this room are also voters. And I've long believed that the way to get over this uh, roadblock, the uh, inertia that we seem to have about change, is to provide people access to the information that really tells them how well or poorly we are doing. And that really relates to your work on the Quality Council. In fact, you know, the, you mentioned universality of availability of service. In fact, we do not have universality. There are many, many people in this country who can't afford prescription drugs, who can't afford home care, who can't afford community services, who can't afford many things. And they, are, they live in a second or third or fourth tier that we were afraid to expose. But I believe that uh, Canadians are pretty well informed people on the whole, as everybody in this room is. And with the appropriate information, uh, we could gain change. And the politicians know that. And so they are very resistant to go to those information systems. Uh, to some degree, providers deserve blame too because they want their system, not, not a general system. David, you wanted to weigh in? Just briefly, um, I, think, um, I think the public uh, can be characterized as being fearful of changing the healthcare system, and I think that is immediately reflected in, their, in the, uh, those that they elect. Um, one of the reasons I believe there is fear of such changes is that most of us can't quite envisage what it would change to, other than watching the CNN and seeing what it looks like down there. <laughs> so the natural reaction is, well, if there's going to be a change, I'm worried, as I think Chris and Duncan said, that it's going to look like that. So in my view, we do need to be brave enough to uh, endeavor to put together large-scale experimental projects that people can see working so that their neighbors say, I'm in this thing, and it works really well, so that then people feel more reassured, and then you could expand those and scale those up even more. But at the moment, we talk about principles and priorities and all of the other mantras of healthcare reform, but for the average person, Mr. and Mrs. Front Porch, they don't quite see what it would be replaced by. So that is an uncertainty that is, uh, that is at least washed out by the certainty of what you have today. At least I know I may have to wait for months for my hip or a week to see my doctor, but I'm familiar with that, and that's probably better than that, I don't know. I'll take one last answer on this question, John. Sure, so I, I think that there's two things that, well, one, one aspect will be that as the demographics change and as we all grow older and require the healthcare system, we will actually probably demand more from the healthcare system because the baby boomers who are going to become the consumers are going to be the ones that drive that change because the healthcare system was designed for people who, who are young, who have single organ disease or single, single diseases. So I think that that will be uh, a big ch uh, impetus to change going forward. The other aspect to that is that what we don't do very well is we can a lot of times conceptualize what it may look like, what's really good, but the change and how we get from there, uh, from here to there is what we don't articulate very much because some of that is going to require huge amounts of resources that to be reinvested to get us from current state to future state. So uh, articulating that will be really important as, as we change and plus uh, articulating where we're going and getting consensus on that. <clears throat> 
Thank you. Top of people's mind, uh, the participants want to know, what will it take to decriminalize all drugs in Canada, and do you think it's a worthwhile policy to pursue? Kieran? <laughs> my, my, my friend David just pointed at me, so I guess I have to speak. <clears throat> um, well, just for context, uh, the number of deaths in Ontario last year uh, was around 875 from uh, opiates. Uh, and uh, some of those are prescribed. The majority were prescribed opiates. Half of them were illicit opiates. And 50% of those that died last year were actually also prescribed a sedative hypnotic and or a, benzodiaz a benzodiazepine, so something like a sleeping pill. So our prescribing from a health quality vantage point needs something to be uh, addressed aggressively and rapidly. Uh, as, as, a, as a primary trigger of this opiate epidemic in, in, in Ontario specifically, but also across North America. So, that is one way of approaching it, but the number of deaths in Ontario is, it should not be acceptable to anyone in this room at 875. It's more than all deaths from motor vehicle collisions in Ontario by hundreds. Uh, and think of all the uh, energy uh, that we put into making our roads safe, our cars safe, and, and, and enforcing the laws regarding those. We are wasting a significant amount of money by criminalizing drug use in our, in our communities, where that, whereas in Portugal, those, those monies now, instead of being spent on the criminal side or put on the social side to enable uh, safe housing uh, and income supports and other medical services to those individuals that have become addicted in our communities. The drugs that are available are highly addictive. It could be anyone in this room that becomes addicted to an opiate. After six days, you can become dependent upon them physically. Um, because they are so powerful. And the more that you're on them, the more the risk that you become addicted and have the social disruption associated with them. So I think we have to start addressing this decriminalization at a population level because these drugs and our prescribing of them are ca causing significant harm and death. Every death is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the social cost to our society. You can think of every death and then the associated admissions to hospital, the uh, visits to the emergency department, the visits to primary care, and the social disruption in our neighborhoods and our communities and our families. Uh, I think we really have to think outside of the box and, and l learn from those jurisdictions that have decriminalized opiates. Stop. Thank you, Kieran. Anybody want to add to that? Okay, well, I, I think that was very well explained, Kieran, so nobody wants to add. Um, the next question is, what are some ways in which we can help mitigate some of the barriers to healthcare systems for marginalized uh, groups, particularly Indigenous communities? So we did a health equity study in partnership with Arlene uh, back in uh, 2011 and 2012, and we looked at how uh, individuals use the health system. And, and we uh, looked at the people that have high risk, to the emer high visit volume and risk to the emergency department and admissions to hospital, and where do they come from, and how accessible is their care. And there are deserts within even the Southeast Lynn where patients don't have access to primary care. Physicians put their there's no control over where a physician practices. They can put their shingle up anywhere in our community, and the vast majority of physicians put their shingle up, their office, close to Kingston Health Sciences Center. They don't put their office where the patient population need is. Only a community health center actually tries to put their practices in communities that are vulnerable and marginalized. And that only represents around 2 to 4% of our patient population that has access to a community health center. There's a huge policy gap uh, in that alone. Uh, uh, and accountability from our primary care uh, providers of where they practice and how they service communities. And it's not planned, it's totally random. And when we did that health equity uh, assessment, we, we identified clearly that there are deserts throughout the Southeast Lynn where primary care didn't put their offices, but their patient population as a result have high visits to the emergency department. The emergency department visit costs around $250 per visit, and admission to hospital is at least $1,000 a day. And a, office visit costs 30 bucks. So if we just thought a little upstream and put our primary care practices appropriately and accessible to the most vulnerable members of our community, we'll save health care system dollars, we'll provide better care at the time that's needed. We also did a survey of our patient population, and the number one point for vulnerable populations, we interviewed them and did face-to-face and, -face <coughs> and focus groups, was accessibility. They don't have a car, they can't take three buses to get to see their family doctor, and they will go to the emergency department because it's open 24-7, and they will get 
good care, but it's intermittent episodic care, which would be much better delivered closer to home in a neighborhood setting where you actually have social services available and an interdisciplinary model to support uh, vulnerable uh, families, including indigenous populations. I better stop. Thank you. Duncan and then David, then Chris. Well, some years ago, I was <clears throat> asked to be a member of what's called the Departmental Audit and Accountability Committee of Health Canada. And I, d I served on that for four years. Uh, very frustrating experience. Of, of the so-called systems that we have, we have 14. And the 14th, or the first, depending on which order you want to take them, belongs to the federal government, which has official responsibility for the care of indigenous populations on reserve. The problem is exactly as, uh, as uh, Ian or as uh, Kevin or Karen <laughs> described, well, need My another cup. Need <laughs> another cup of coffee. Uh, compounded by the fact that the federal government has responsibility distributed between Health Canada and the Department of Indian and Northern Affairs, which uh, was a, a tremendous frustration to those of us on the so-called DAC because we could not get answers. A, there was no information, and B, uh, the idea of changing that, the reward system for a, a, a primary care call from 30 bucks to 60 bucks or 90 bucks or something like that was just beyond discussion at that time. And that, that could resolve some of those issues. David? I don't have any easy answers, and uh, if any of us did here, I think we'd probably be sitting in Ottawa where there are no easy answers found either. This is, in my personal and relatively uninformed view, uh, an issue of equity. Um, I think our nation and other developed nations are lumbering toward increasing inequity across, across groups and across generations even. And it is uh, an inequity that we see as expressed for the marginalized populations, First Nations people, indigenous people, homeless people, the poor, those who are drug addicted, uh, those with mental illness. And our health system, ostensibly patient-centered, is actually very provider-centered, and providers are humans, and so it is probably easier to look after your colleague that you see at the golf club on Wednesdays than it is to work your way around how you care for someone who is homeless, lives on the street, uh, was a single mother from a First Nations reserve and is now a city, living in a city. So I believe we need to think about this as a way in which we reorganize our care and our philosophy toward people. Um, the cultural, ethnicities, the issues that we don't always understand are central to this. Duncan's mentioned my second point, which was the governance issues, so who's actually in charge, and that has certainly not helped um, with particularly First Nations people. Um, and, and I think in the way in which we deliver, once we've decided we should and must, um, needs to be a different model. We need the determinants of health to be addressed. Uh, these are as much social problems as they are medical problems, and so uh, I favor approaches that are led by um, community-based, uh, patient-oriented, social worker, nurse practitioner, dietitian, maybe employment counselor, and so on and so forth, addressing the social determinants of health to try to reduce these inequities, let alone all of those social programs to maintain a, an, an annual income that is, that is one, can, one can be satisfied with. Chris? Yeah, just to build on those comments, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, for me as a, as a subspecialist, by the time a patient gets to me and they're sick, there's very little I can do about equity. Uh, further upstream, in the primary care community and in the, uh, in the community in general, there's, there's more that can be done. And there are some exemplars um, around, uh, you know, getting into some of the social space, like uh, Gary Block at St. Mike's, who has this program where he talks about prescribing money, which sounds a little um, audacious. But what he, what he means is that he's helping people fill out their income tax forms so that they can get uh, an income tax return if they, if they didn't have the, uh, the ability or the, or the resources to, to figure out how to do that. So it, it's, it's saying that healthcare providers can be in that social care space. Even further upstream, um, 
the year I was uh, uh, involved with the CMA, we were lobbying for a health in all government policies approach where we simply asked for a healthcare lens to be applied to all cabinet level decisions. Uh, and that gets into social care. And then even further upstream is where people like Ryan Miley in Saskatchewan seem to be. He's, he's running for the leadership of the NDP and will probably be Saskatchewan's next premier. You heard it here first, um, not to get partisan. But he talks about um, um, uh, health as sort of the ultimate um, uh, metric for the, the well-being of a society. He says, why are we talking about the GDP as, as, uh, as how successful we are as a society? It should be how healthy are our citizens. And he's, he's talking about bringing a whole government approach to that. So I think, you know, the, the theme here is that the more we integrate uh, health and social care, the more we'll get bang for our buck. But we are laboring under a delusion if we believe the healthcare system can fix uh, inequities by itself because we, we contribute a very small proportion to the health of Canadians, somewhat ironically, perhaps. Okay, great. So you've talked a bit, a bit about the community, community care. I was going to move on to the next question. Um, uh, people would like to know what um, should Canada allow further access to private health care services within Canada? What's the role of the private sector in the delivery of the health care services? Do you want to take this one, Scott, and maybe link back to the previous question? Yeah, no, that's okay. I mean, I think the private sector uh, has a lot to contribute. The, the, the reality is that public policy, health care policy, is the purview of elected representatives and all of the people. So the sort of far right notion that the private sector should somehow take that over is not something that I would ever uh, condone. But the private sector um, kind of feeds itself on innovation and new ideas. And so the extent to which the private sector and the public sector healthcare can partner and partner uh, profitably to both is something that uh, I think has a lot of, uh, of scope to it. And uh, particularly in the areas of strategic alliances where the private sector can bring expertise often and resources that wouldn't be available to the public sector. The public sector has policy uh, objectives. Partnering between the two has a lot uh, going for it. So I don't, uh, I don't support either of the extremes that business should never have any role in healthcare nor that it should have an overwhelming role, but somewhere in between and uh, partnerships, public-private partnerships and strategic alliances, I think is a lot of scope for improved service provision. Thank you, Scott. Duncan? Let's not kid ourselves. The so-called delivery system is in fact provided by, the prime, by private care. I mean, in Ontario, hospitals, uh, with a very few exceptions, are private enterprise and uh, uh, family physicians are generally private enterprise. So the delivery of health care is in fact in the hands of the private sector and has been and is in most countries. Now it's highly regulated in most cases, but uh, uh, the, this, this uh, ogre, the specter of going the U.S. route is really what's stopping us from considering how to blend public policy objectives with private sector incentives. David? My view is that uh, we all pay for it one way or the other. Um, and my interest is that this country is the only developed country that has um, two or three bands or elements of our healthcare system paid for from the public purse, first dollar, zero deductible, um, so we don't have to pay a penny for the doctor, for the hospital, and then leaves relatively uncovered many of the other arenas that other countries do cover in terms of drugs, dental, eye, home care, to some extent, long-term care, um, mental health. So we have this uh, aversion in Canada to having to pay for health services. We believe that that violates our ethos and our principles as Canadians, and yet we pay more for health services than most other developed countries out of our pockets. Now we can get insurance plans. So I think it's a strange conversation because we, 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 we fear paying for it, but yet we do it. So are there better models of blending what comes out of our pocket that we may be fortunate enough to have covered either by wealth or by insurance plans, employment benefit plans, and or subsidization for those who can't afford it? Uh, and public funds, and the balance um, is not as important in my mind as the range across which we provide those services. 
Um, a very significant minority of Canadians cannot access uh, pharmaceuticals because they can't afford to pay for the drugs that are prescribed. Now, Ontario has made a step by, I saw the advertisements last night in bed, that we now cover people to the age of 25 with your OHIP card for drugs. So we've got 0 to 25, 65 plus. That's right. And, well, speak, actually, that, I, hate, I hate to say it, it just helps me. As a disclosure, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, a, I'm a, an inch over 65. Um, which leaves, of course, the bulk in the middle. But, so, so that's my concern about this. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think it's a ma matter of balance. Um, I, I, don't, I think th the issue more is that we spend a vast amount of money, more than most countries per capita, for mediocre results. So whether we pay out of our pocket or whether the taxpayer pays for us, that's us, the government pays for us, we're not getting value for money. So let's argue for value for money, however we go to pay for it. Anybody else want to weigh in on the privatization? Chris? Well, just to build on what David said, I guess the other element of this is, is equity, to harken back to the earlier question. So, you know, we highly value equity in the way that we distribute our public resources. But in fact, and we've written a blog on this, and you may want to refer to that, um, the notion that we, we concentrate most of our public investment in hospitals and doctors and then have kind of a free-for-all and all of the rest of it is, is arguably far more inequitable than if the public investment were somehow distributed across a broader swath of services um, in a way that, uh, that delivered more equitable care. Okay, now the room wants to hear from you. They, they, this is your two-minute pitch. What is a key policy change in healthcare that you would consider to be ex uh, essential and explain why it should be a, a priority? Anybody? I'll go first because it'll be easier. <laughs> David? Um, that's a really trick question because you've got to prioritize one out of a complex mixture of issues. Uh, if I were to pick one policy change, uh, I would pick the one that I think accounts most for our uh, low rankings in international comparisons, and that's access. I would change the approach to access so that access to primary care in whatever form that is, hopefully expanded primary care to include many of the social determinants of health, and access through that system, that gate gatekeeper function to whatever secondary or tertiary care that's needed. It is astonishing that our peer uh, and comparable countries seem to manage same or next day access to primary care for the vast majority of its population, including the marginalized by various means, and then relatively modest wait times to get whatever procedures or investigations are required. Um, I believe that's important. I believe it is an equity uh, issue, but I think it, it's, it's, if one is to invest 200 and, or whatever percentage of that, 70% of 242 billion of our dollars in healthcare, I think we deserve to uh, orient ourselves to solving the problem of access. Thank you, Kieran. I'm a public health physician, so I have to say tobacco, 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 and I'll say it again and again and again. Um, I, I think uh, tobacco has a differential effect on our society. It's the most disenfranchised that have the highest smoking rates. It's the poorest members of our community that have the highest smoking rates. It's those with associated mental health uh, dis disorders and diseases that have high smoking rates. And as a result, they die 10 years younger than their age match cohorts. And, and I think a tobacco endgame is essential from a policy vantage point, and it can save costs. Uh, the, the tobacco causes a tremendous amount of illness in our community, not just lung cancer, but chronic obstructive lung disease, cardiovascular disease, etc. And there could be huge health dividends paid if we concentrated on eliminating the 4,000 chemicals and 69 no, nor known carcinogens that you inhale uh, every time you smoke. Uh, and from, from, for me, I think it's very cost effective if we just concentrate on limiting tobacco, set a time where we're going to have tobacco out of our society or at down to 5% smoking rate by 2035. I think it's a brilliant idea and we've hosted one of the first meetings nationally here in, 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 at Queen's University uh, to create a tobacco end game. Thank you. John? So I, I think one of the big areas that would be interesting and I think would be really helpful is to is to stop and and we've alluded to this in some of the other conversations is to is to actually integrate social care and health care together into one 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 overriding agenda and that way um, any policy any social policies could be aligned with with what health care is and vice versa around 
So, so you could start to think about, especially from an aging and vulnerable point of view, you could start to think about what elder-friendly communities would, be, uh, would look like when you design them, how you actually leverage some of the resources that are in the communities into improving the care of population. So for example, um, um, the, the postman comes around, well, they, they, could, they could also check in on vulnerable seniors and, and doing those sort of things. So if you start to, to change where, how healthcare, because healthcare right now is a very, is a big monolith, but it tends to operate in isolation, but changing the way the lens through that, I think that would be a big way forward uh, to improving the way things are done. Duncan, did you want to take this one? If I had to pick one thing, I'm debating in my mind whether I would uh, insist on our governments actually articulating a vision of what we as a society want to achieve by having a health system. Uh, if you go and search for it, you will not find vision statements that, in fact, governments, uh, any government, including the federal government, really have in mind. So uh, that would be top of my list. But second on my list would be the foundation stone for implementing what my colleagues have said, and that is the creation of a genuine health information system throughout the country that, in fact, will reveal the data that will persuade people that change is both essential and would save us money uh, overall. I don't believe, notwithstanding your, your effort, Kieran, and many others, that the ordinary Canadian understands the cost of uh, selling cigarettes. They just don't. Uh, but if they did, they would say, boy, that's costing us a lot of money. We better stop that. So we have an MPA uh, policy instruments question. How much scope is there for direct, di direct policy and government intervention in the diet of Canadians, for example, salt or sugar taxes? <laughs> well, it very, it very much depends on the government of the day. So under, under the pre-existing uh, government at the federal level, there is very little uh, interest in being involved in changing uh, the food industry and uh, restricting salt. And they actually, uh, they, they uh, funded the salt study and then put it aside and didn't integrate any of their um, recommendations. And they did the same with trans fats. They said the uh, food industry should decrease trans fats in their foods uh, and prepare to eliminate it at some point in time. And it's only when a new government came in town and said, you will eliminate trans fats from the diet of Canadians, whereas other jurisdictions had already put this in play. So uh, there's a huge policy play that can be made to make our foods safer uh, and uh, to engineer safety into the foods by simple elimination of some products like trans fats. And yet the governments have been loathsome to do it, but I, I got to applaud the federal government at, at present that has uh, mandated that, uh, not just recommended, but mandated that the, uh, uh, some elimination of some products occur. We, that will alone will have a huge health benefit and that the song for that has not been sung loud and clear enough that p policy changes at a population level can have a huge health benefit and salt reduction is one of them uh, engineering uh, safer and better foods is another caloric um, 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 monitoring so now you go to a store a restaurant and you can see how many calories are in every food to me that might ha help some people make decisions on some of their food but uh, it's inequitable because those that have the lowest education and or uh, the diff most difficulty reading aren't going to understand the implications for making those decisions so to me it's an, not an equity piece uh, when, when they make uh, uh, those types of policies but it's a start to make people more aware of uh, the calorie content and, and impact on health. But it has to, that has to coincide with a huge education piece, which is gonna cost money and effort, whereas major, major policy pieces where you eliminate a food uh, uh, or content in a food have much bigger uh, health implications. Thank you. Does anybody else wanna take that, Chris? Yeah, just to, to build on that a little bit, you know, the uh, beyond uh, public education and regulation, there's also this integration 
as well with some of the social determinants. So it's, it's no coincidence that uh, places, uh, neighborhoods with lower socioeconomic status have a lot of McDonald's and Tim Hortons, but you can't buy uh, any fresh produce. You know? So these are the kinds of things that policy might not fix, but this is the kind of uh, place where you know, an engagement with the private sector may you know, create some really interesting conversations about um, what, what corporate citizenship looks like in the 21st century en route to a, a healthier population. Thanks. David, did you want to? Uh, just a small touch of irony. I took one of my grandkids to a Queen's football game recently, and uh, um, we were wandering around once in there looking for something to drink with our hot dog, which was a low-calorie hot dog. <laughs> and, and, of course, it's, uh, he, he, he's very well brought up, little boy. He wanted a bottled water. But, of course, you can't buy bottled water on campus. You can buy bottled everything else. So, and I couldn't find a bottle of anything else. It wasn't packed with sugar. Now, of course, if you take your bottle, you can fill it up from a water fountain, but we didn't think of that. So there was a, 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 an inverse incentive to, to actually consume vast amounts of sugar, which he did, and then, of course, he went nuts. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, did you want to add to that, Kieran? So if we want to deal with the, the food deserts, not desserts, food deserts, the, 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 it's a huge policy play. Think of the effort that I would have to put in play to work with my municipal partners to change the zoning bylaws to increase the availability and accessibility of, of healthy foods to populations that need it, and then the incentivization of purchasing of those and the de-incentivizing of, of high sugar, high caloric, uh, nutritionally deprived foods. It's a huge amount of effort at a local level where, where, where I am not seeing the direction at a provincial or federal level to, to, to enable this type of action. And, and yeah, I can, I can spend a lot of our time trying to do this type of work, but we really need an uh, overarching vision of health for our community that's going to incorporate all these recommendations so that we don't have to do it 36 health units, doing it 36 different types uh, of ways, whereas we just need leadership and health policy incorporated in decisions made at a, at a, at a provincial or federal Okay, thank you. Which country's healthcare system do you think is, is the best model for Canada to learn from? David? USA. <laughs> <laughs> Although um, I would say um, not, little corners of the USA do have a great deal to teach us. Um, uh, you know, nearly 100% of people in Massachusetts have healthcare coverage. Uh, People who are enrolled in Intermountain Health or Kaiser Permanente have a pretty well integrated system. Um, there is no country, um, but there are many, many countries, um, each of which can, can, uh, can uh, give us something to learn from. Recognizing that our country is encumbered by a federal, provincial, territorial system that makes change very, very difficult, and a, a population that's clustered in strange fashions. So one always looks at Australia. I'm particularly taken with little bits of other countries. I'm very taken with the experiment that's going on in New Zealand around Christchurch, um, with the, uh, which was a burning platform following an earthquake that led to a massive reorganization in the way in which healthcare was provided, forced by the fact that most of their buildings fell over. And therefore, their institutional structures physically fell over. And, uh, it is well worth reading about, um, and it's very elegant. I always love the Danish model. You can't compare Denmark to Canada, but um, the Danish model that invests very heavily in home and community care and hasn't built a nursing home bed since 1988, um, and yet doesn't have alternate level of care patients and doesn't have clustered emergency departments. So I like bits of Denmark. I'm, I'm always intrigued by the fact that in Lebanon, based on cultural practices, families care for their elder uh, relatives to, to the end of life, and they don't need long-term care facilities. Um, I believe the changes that have occurred in South Korea have been massive over the course of 30 years. So I think one of the things Canadians can do is to look everywhere else and see what works and see what could work here. So uh, there's no one country, but there are many. Thank you. Scott? David, David covered a lot of countries, <laughs> certain that down, but I'd like to just follow on uh, on the point about Australia, and, uh, and use this as a way of jumping back into Duncan's uh, point about the politics of it all. It's that uh, for one of the conferences that I mentioned at the EdSet we held, we flew a whole group in from Australia to talk about how they had managed to do somewhat of an integrated system for primary and uh, tertiary uh, care. 
and uh, although subsequent governments have dismantled uh, parts of that, Australia at least has a similar, not exact, but a similar uh, system to ours and has the same issues of federal and, in their case, uh, state uh, governments. But, but here's the double back to, so I've always looked to Australia for that feature, but here's the double back to, uh, to Duncan's point, and it's that, it's that when we asked the Australians how it is that they came from a very similar uh, fragmented and uh, rigid approach, uh, uh, much like we have currently in Canada, they said, look, it was just kind of in a way the luck of the draw. The, uh, the politicians, the political landscape changed somewhat. You had a federal leader who was very open to a national approach to health care and several state uh, heads who, who shared that. So a coming together of, uh, of uh, a meeting of the minds and, and very significant need, much like we have in Canada, for a far more common approach to many of the issues like drugs and, uh, and, and so forth. The, the big impediment that we always raise to major change in health care is political. The, the cynics will say, oh, no, no, it's a provincial territorial jurisdiction, so there's, ideologically, there's no way that we should do things together. And a set of skeptics will say, well, never mind that. You just could never bring it a, 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 about any way. And uh, Duncan and I, we've had this debate over the years uh, quite a bit. But, but I think that if there's a sufficient will and we are good enough at and effective enough at communicating to the body politic in turn to pressure politicians, that if any country should be able to do something on a pan-Canadian basis, surely after 150 years, we should be one of them. So I remain optimistic, naive, that, that it's, it's possible for us to do this and this would I think take care of a lot of the kinds of misconnection between policy that we currently experience. Thank you, Scott. Duncan? Well, Scott, I'm glad you're optimistic because the alternative is not very attractive, I must say. Uh, at the start of the question, there was a little chant about USA. Uh, don't, uh, one of the great advantages of living in Canada is that we live next to a country where according to Britnell, uh, who from KPMG wrote a book about the ideal health system, which he said doesn't exist, and I, with which I agree. But in the United States, among the several countries from which he would borrow uh, some elements, uh, he, did, he did choose the United States for its innovativeness. And it's true that in, uh, to the south of us, there's everything from the truly awful to the truly wonderful. And one of the health systems genuinely, using that term genuinely, uh, that exists in the United States is Kaiser Permanente, which in its five divisions serves to, to foster the health of as many people as live in Ontario. Uh, they have been through the wars of a common information system. They bear the scars of having everybody adopt it. And as a consequence, they know what they are doing. It would be a very simple matter, really, to emulate it, emulate uh, Kaiser from an operational point of view, but emulating uh, Kaiser from a political point of view would be impossible. John? So uh, I think one of the, um, the other things that we should consider is, is, is that um, when we talk about which country to emulate, the implication is that we're going to adopt it widely across Canada, which may actually not be the possible. And, and maybe that we need to think about changing our 14 healthcare systems and view that as a strength, that we can actually tailor, um, that we can actually tailor what uh, what we do in one province, um, and which may be very different than what you do in another province. So what you do in Nova Scotia or New Brunswick may be very different than what you do um, in in Ontario. So, for example, the Danish system is viewed as one uh, as a great system, but people then come back and say, "Well, they're a small country; they're only five million people." Well, that that's bigger than actually a lot of the provinces that that we could implement it in. So it's not 
one system, maybe at the end of the day that will be the best for across Canada. It will be multiple different systems that are optimized to the provinces that they exist in. Chris? And this varies off the question a tiny little bit, but just to pick up on the comments of the last three speakers. The middle ground, of course, is to figure out, well, what is the role of the federal government? So if we, if we accept that there's a lot of value in sort of customizing, taking advantage of the fact that we have 14 systems, uh, what are the federal levers? So what is their skin in the game? Well, they have influence over tax policy. They have uh, large uh, influence over uh, federal agencies, many of which uh, have uh, skin in the information game. There may be an advantage of national standards on some things that we can agree are very Canadian and it's in everybody's best interest that, that all boats float up. So, um, so rather than sort of have this, um, you know, everybody has to fit into the same peg, uh, maybe the more useful conversation is, well, within the existing constitutional structure, what are the federal levers? And let's talk about how we uh, maximize that and bring them up to their, to their full potential. I, sa I sound completely like Duncan. I realize I just channeled Duncan, and I'm sorry. <laughs> That's great. I think we have time for uh, uh, another question. So what are, and I'm guessing this is for you, Kieran, what are the major barriers to updating guidelines and policy related to opioid prescribing practices in Canada? Where do we start? Well, Chris is an expert on, from HQO, but because we don't have accountability or direct uh, line of supervision over primary care, um, they, they prescribe around 38, 39% of all opiates within Ontario. That, that, to me, that's a huge gap. You ha uh, the highest prescribers of opiates in Ontario are single physi solo uh, physician practices, males over 50 years of age, so, so me, uh, working in fee-for-service practices that uh, have a high proportion of uh, patient population that's vulnerable and, and poor. And those practices aren't linked to accountability. The college doesn't necessarily supervise their practices. They don't have a family health team where they can bounce ideas off other physicians. Uh, they're not accountable to a hospital structure, so they've been left to practice independently uh, under pre-existing guidelines that have changed uh, over, over the last five to ten years, and we have no means of measuring the quality of the work that we're doing. So 17 years into the uh, epidemic of harms associated with uh, opiates, we have a narcotic monitoring system, and a, and a family physician can voluntarily uh, not mandated, get a review of how they're prescribing opiates as compared to an age, age match practice cohort. But it's voluntary. So there's no measure or means or mandate to ensure quality, to ensure oversight, to, uh, to uh, provide ongoing improved education for some physicians whose prescribing is aberrant. Uh, nor in the coroner system, if someone dies uh, uh, with uh, five pill bottles of a physician uh, at the scene, the coroner in, in the past didn't even write down the name of who the prescriber was. So the physician would never even get any feedback that perhaps their prescribing was associated with a death in the community and or uh, an overdose in the community. So from a quality vantage point, there's huge gaps and huge accountability um, that need to get addressed uh, and, and we're 17 years into it. Thank you, David. It's, it's a f challenging, challenging uh, issue. Um, I read recently that uh, when you start to unpackage the issue of uh, opiates and prescribing, um, that one looks at the populations which are disproportionately those who are in poverty, who are less well-educated and often unemployed, disaffected, um, overlap that with the fact that many people live with chronic pain, perhaps uh, in part uh, because of those circumstances. Um, ally that to the fact that in the mid-1990s, uh, physicians persuaded themselves and were persuaded that the management of chronic pain had been inadequate and that these wonderful new drugs produced by Purdue Pharmaceuticals, about which you can read in the New Yorker, Google Purdue New Yorker and read the story of this very wealthy family that owned Purdue and to this day endows museums and wonderful philanthropic things. Um, I, anyway, um, when I was in practice, um, some of my colleagues across the country would uh, invite us to dinner and talk about the, uh, the wisdom of prescribing uh, uh, 
um, oxycodone or its equivalent to those in chronic pain because the risk of addiction was minimal and that people would then be able to return to work. Um, this was all false. Um, one of the problems now, of course, is, as, uh, as uh, Kieran says, the oversight of prescribing is minimal, um, uh, although it is increasing. Uh, the alternatives are also not available. Uh, Ruth Wilson, who would be here to destroy this mantle approach of white males, um, for which I apologize, um, would say that when her patient requests further prescriptions of narcotics, and she uh, tries to work with them to reduce or get off those. The alternatives of pain clinics, pain experts, and those in a multidisciplinary way to help deal with that are very hard to access. So that becomes a problem as well. But uh, and the last point I'll make is it is, from a societal point of view, fascinating to me. This is a North American problem. This doesn't happen in Europe as it is here. BC is projecting 1,500 deaths this coming year. Um, I was asked by the government to get involved in looking at SARS after SARS because this nation was convulsed by the fact that 44 people died of SARS. 44 only. In Toronto, in Toronto of course. Well, Toronto is special. Uh, nobody should die in Toronto. But just to put it again in the context that we're seeing hundreds and hundreds of people dying um, in Kingston um, and across this country and in North America something that's a societal phenomenon that we're not seeing in Australia or in Denmark or London. Chris, one last comment? Well, it shows the power of marketing, right? And the Sackler brothers sort of introduced uh, marketing in pharmaceuticals. And, uh, you know, even if you take the argument that, uh, well, it really was sincere. We really did believe that there was an epidemic of chronic pain that was under-recognized and that, uh, you know, this slow-release opiate was the... Was the, the uh, you know, the key, well, the company to this day is using those same marketing strategies in, you know, outside of North America. So, you know, the, the height of unethical corporate behavior is, is Purdue Pharma uh, right now. You can tweet that if you want and I'll take all the hate mail that I need. But just to reassure you somewhat, maybe, uh, at Health Quality Ontario, we're, we're almost at the finish line with uh, quality standards for prescribing of opioids for acute pain and for, and for chronic pain. Um, they've been meticulously worked up. The methodology is outstanding, and as I said earlier, it'll be backed by, you know, some legislative weight. And so, as we roll these standards out, we hope it'll start to move the dial a bit. So I'm conscious of time, and we've had some really good questions, and there are still more questions. What I'm going to do is share those questions with the panel, and maybe there'll be one or two blog posts coming out of those questions. And I want to give the panelists an, uh, a last opportunity to say a couple of words about the state of the healthcare system, and then we'll. We'll uh, wrap it up. So, David? I'm, I'm taken with a question, I don't have an answer for it, but what are some of the ways in which we can address the systemic discrimination and inequality in access to healthcare for the LGBTQ community? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I, will, I will say my view is that, that society, and as it's expressed through those who provide services to society, uh, continue to be bedeviled by the stigmatization of uh, various groups. Um, I remember as an emergency physician the first time a patient with full-blown AIDS came to the Kingston General Hospital Emergency Department surrounded by paramedics in hazmat suits, nurses who had to prepare for an hour before their arrival to be donned with hazmat suits, sent to the dirty room, which is actually where we put the garbage, um, and lay on a stretcher alone. And um, I went down to see this gentleman and I shook his hand. Uh, I think many health providers have told this story because they've done it as well. He burst into tears because I was the first person who touched him in a week. And uh, everybody clustered around me and tried to take me away to shower me. And I pointed out that I didn't think you could get AIDS from shaking hands, that I thought I either had to share blood products or have sex with this man. And was met with stares. I think, I, think, um, I think those of us, all of us in society, but particularly those who have a responsibility to care for others, need to be very conscious of our implicit biases uh, for those of different gender orientations, different cultures, and it all gets back to education and understanding and losing the fear of those, uh, of those uh, situations. So I don't have any answers, but I do believe it's a big issue, and I thank the people who asked it. Duncan? Well, I've been at this for a long time, and 
Madam Chair, I, uh, I really deplore your use of the word system, and I deplore your <laughs> use of the word system, David, <laughs> and every member of the panel. Uh, I hope I would live long enough that, in fact, when I next hear the word system, that we might really actually have one. And uh, that, that's the start. We've got to put these pieces together, bind them with an information system that we're all sharing, and in fact talk about a real collection of institutions, organizations, and individuals that are really committed to enhancing the ability of the Canadian population to live good, long lives in sound health. Thank you, Duncan. Kieran? I think one of the most important pieces is that we shouldn't be investing more in the health care system, but we should be investing more in health. Uh, and I really think we need to have health in all policy, which is mentioned here before, and I very much see the value of policy generators that have, have a health lens or health equity lens associated with them. And the big threats to the health of our population continue to be tobacco, healthy eating, active living. And active living is associated, if you're not having active living, you're associated with mental health disorders, anxiety, depression, etc. We have to start concentrating on health and not invest any further in the health system health system fo I said the word, Long the S word. word, it was an S word. Uh, said it twice, we I can't think. afford as a society to keep, keep putting money into the downstream when we should be going upstream. Yeah. Uh, and if I was to concentrate just on the health system, the primary care reform, I really see the value of primary care contributing to the health system. We have not harnessed the, the, well the value of primary care uh, in primary, secondary, or tertiary prevention, and they can be a great partner to the acute care sector, but we haven't linked them. There's no system linking primary care and the acute care, and that, that is a huge deficiency in the, uh, where we can get value for money, but not put any more cash into health care. Thank you. John? So I'm, I'm just going to be a bit more optimistic. I, I think that um, um, we started off in a good place. We slid down, downwards, and, and some lots have been driven by demographic changes, by changes in society. But I think right now, we actually have a great opportunity to cherry pick from around the world as to what happens. And I think it will happen. It will be driven and we will get there. But, and sometimes it's really hard when, you're, when you hear all the negative stuff that's uh, uh, everywhere that you know, we, it, things are terrible. But I think there's been change and, and I think it will accelerate and we will get there. And, and I don't think we're that far off from being able to get back to one of the highest performing systems um, in, uh, um, in the world. Now, that may be all the opiates I'm taking, but <laughs> I, I'm just kidding. But I think we will get there. Chris, final words? Well, uh, I've been interested now for some time in um, you know, how we can harness uh, my profession and the other healthcare professions to unleash the creativity that I know is there. You know, and um, you know, how do we move um, from the very noble goals of caring for individual patients to generating some sort of a sense of civic professionalism around stewardship of the system. And I, I personally believe, and I say this genuinely as someone who benefits a lot from the vagaries of the fee-for-service schedule, I'm very advantaged as a cardiologist, very overpaid, you might say, um, that if we can transform the way that we, we pay for health professionals, um, that, that can excite people into some really innovative stuff. And I'll, I'll say to rooms of physicians who are in this very toxic environment, very concerned about what's happening in Ontario, if I said, you know, I'm going to pay you what you're making now, I'm going to give you a 3% increase every year, just, just presume that your income is secure and it's no longer a threat. Now, how would you like to come to work and what do you want to do today to make to make the system better and to make the health of the people that we serve better. And it's very different from what their day looks like in a fee-for-service environment. Now that doesn't mean that fee-for-service is inherently evil or that people are doing bad things, but it's missing a huge opportunity to unleash the creativity of uh, healthcare providers to come up with a system. <laughs>